Okay. I'm so excited with what I have for you. And again, I probably should have turned it into a series, but we're going to move through it because God gave me another series that I'm even more excited about, but you have to wait till next year for that. But, and it's amazing how that song plays in with it. So, you know, we serve uh, an inexhaustible God who there, there's just so much that He wants to give us that uh, we just have to stay focused. All right, let's move quickly. Most of you know that uh, we recently picked up a, and cared for a, my best friend's, uh, one of my good friend's uh, puppy, Rich Livengood, and uh, we, it was exciting to uh, see him again, and, and he's really struggling with chemotherapy, but that's little, uh, little Jacks there. Now, Susan, our, um, our breeder, warned both Rich and us that this puppy had severe separation anxiety which is going to make him a very, very loyal dog, but without proper training, it's going to make him a very annoying animal. So we got home, and, and uh, slowly he found his feet, and eventually he was running all over the house like he owned the place. And uh, like babies, puppies can very easily become overly stimulated, and they need to sleep and eat a lot. And uh, I found it very interesting when he just ran into Brink's crate, popped down, fell asleep. They like dark places, and, and uh, he was very happy to, to be in Brinks' crate. Brinks wasn't very happy about it, but uh, he decided to he just let it fly. So later that night, when it was time for bed, I, I put the puppy back in the crate, closed the door, went, shut the light off, went to bed. You would have thought that someone was killing that animal. It was the most horrendous sound you've ever heard. He, yelped and, and cried and screamed and just about the time you thought that, that uh, he was settling down, he would just start in again and it was just horrible. Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. She was going to regress. Okay. So this dog just, just went on and on and on. So eventually calmed down, we got a little bit of sleep. The, the next night, I, I thought, okay. The puppy's got to go out, the puppy's going to cry, and so um, I slept on the couch knowing I'd have to get up every couple hours let him out, reassure him. He was worse. Much worse. Like, the, the most horrible sounds you can imagine coming from an animal. And not just, you'd be angry, I, I can deal with angry, but it was such a, a pitiful moan that even my cold heart, I felt bad for him, you know? So... While I was laying there, um, unable to sleep, frustrated, I, I began an interesting train of thought that um, concerning our relationship with God and His presence, and uh, hopefully it'll be a help to you. Turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We're going to be all over God's Word tonight. Uh, one of my... Concerns is that there's just so many scriptures here that I'm going to have to really pick and choose what we read. But Psalm 139, begin reading verse number 1. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising, and Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful me. for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, and the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So, the, the fact of God's omnipresence is not a, a, the, the point of tonight. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. We are never outside of His presence. He sees all. He knows all. He is always there. However, our awareness of Him is limited, and the extent to which we are aware of Him changes 
based on where we are in life, different seasons of life. One of the things that affects our ability to understand him is, or perceive his presence, is our sin. Sometimes our awareness of his presence is limited by our sinful choices. Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. What, what did God ask Adam and Eve after they had sinned? Where are you? Again, does that mean God's not on my present? That God didn't know? He was asking them a question. Flip back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Begin reading verse number 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit." We'll come back to Psalm 51 later. It's important that you recognize, especially in, um, in verse number 11, that you recognize a dispensational difference, that this is an Old Testament verse. We notice and we learn that in the New Testament, because of what Jesus did on the cross, the Holy Spirit comes within us and stays. But in the Old Testament, that was not the case. The Holy Spirit would come upon people and leave. But the point I want to make here by pointing your uh, attention to this verse in verse 11 is that the fact of God's omnipresence does not negate the fact that sin separates us from Him relationally. You ever been sitting right next to your spouse and been very far apart? You ever been standing in a crowd and felt very lonely? That's exactly what we're talking about. You can be very far from God who is omnipresent and right there sitting next to you. This puppy was very aware of the difference between casually napping in the crate and being locked into the crate. You see, too often we mosey our way through life and we go into dark places and we think dark things and we do dark things. Confident that, well, God's with me, I'll be okay. And then we turn around and realize we've lost our way. We turn around and realize that the devil has locked the door. We realize that we have become addicted. We realize that we are now starting to suffer consequences. And we can't just turn around and get out of that dark place we are in. Then we want to call out to God. Then we recognize how far we are from him. We think of Luke chapter 15 where the prodigal son went to the far country, far away from his father. The Bible says he came to his senses. He was hungry. He was in there with the pigs and he said, I'm going to go back to my father. You know, aren't you glad for God's mercy? Amen. Aren't you glad for God's grace? Aren't you glad for God's forgiveness? Aren't you glad that you cannot possibly go beyond His reach? You can never be outside of His sight. You better remember that. If you are feeling far from God, the first thing you better check is are you in sin? Is there a reason you feel far from God? Unfortunately, far too many people settle for an imaginary God. They settle for an imaginary 
presence. They settle for an imaginary hope. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, talks about the fact that many will say unto him in that day, judgment day, Lord, Lord. And they'll talk about all the things that they did. God's going to say, I, I never knew you. You didn't have a relationship with me. Think about that. Because, you know, that very thing can happen right here in and among us. People can settle for an imaginary God. They can choose to imagine. Well, I just, I, I like to think of God this way. Or I like to think of God that way. I just think God is okay with this, that, or the other. And some people will go so far as to say, well, that may be okay for you. That, that's how you might interpret it. I just feel, and what they'll go on to say is that they feel just fine. Their imagination is strong enough that they can imagine peace and they can imagine up or conjure up good enough feelings to get by and go on in their sinful life. And if you, if you think I'm coming from left field, you need to pay closer attention. There are plenty of people who call themselves Christians who espouse not only different doctrines, but false doctrine, false gospel. And they feel just fine. Better be careful about that. You see, there will be, in when you are in sin, there will be a conscience, there will be a Holy Spirit of God speaking to you, and you may, dead, you may fight that conscience, you may sear that conscience, you may quench the Spirit, you may push Him away, you may surround yourself with all sorts of things that make you feel good. But there will always be that still small voice whispering, saying, You know who you are. You know what you are. Where are you? You better listen to that. Amen. God wants you to be right with Him. God wants you to be right with Him. The second night, I was so frustrated with this puppy because we were in the same room. All right? He could hear my voice. If I turned the light on, he could see me. We were, we were right there. And I, I got to confess to you, I broke. All right? I broke. Contrary to, to this point that I'm getting ready to make, you know, I broke. I ended up, you know, bringing him over there. And I didn't put him on the couch with me. But I let him curl up right there with, with Brinks and Max. As he would at least shut up. But... The reason why I bought him with the crate in the first place, and some, some people would just say that. They would logically say, if you put him in the crate and he cries, don't put him in the crate. Let him sleep in bed with you. Or let him you know, sleep at the foot of the bed. Or let him do whatever he wants. Here's the problem. You, a German shepherd can be a very dangerous animal. Not to mention the fact. You're complaining, you know, you might complain, say, well, well, the dog is uh, howling, so we'll, we'll just let him in. Have you ever tried sleeping with a German Shepherd? I remember when, when we, not long after we brought Saber home, I remember hearing my dad say, earthquake, in the middle of the night. We thought, what? There's no earthquake. Saber was up against the bed, scratching. <laughs> Woke dad up, and dad thought it was an earthquake. So, here's, let me get back on my notes. I was aware of this puppy's separation anxiety. And I was aware of the fact that crate training is an important part of a German Shepherd's training. They need to understand that they are in a new pack, and there are rules, and there are expectations, and that they are the dog, and you are the adult, and they need to do what they're told. And they need to learn how to operate where they're supposed to be. You know, sometimes being Christians requires God to put us in situations where we struggle to feel His presence. These are Navy SEALs being drowned proof. Their hands and feet are tied and they are thrown in a pool. And they have to learn to do what they've been trained to do such that they cannot drown. 
to learn how to, how to cope with water actually going down the, the back of their throat, how to get up and down and move back and forth. Why? God intends for us to grow up. You see, these soldiers are put into places where it's dark, where it's cold, where it's painful. In, in multiple places in God's Word, we, we hear saints crying out to God saying, Why am I here? Why am I in this situation? Job comes to mind. Habakkuk, Isaiah, Jeremiah come to mind. Where they're saying, Lord, why do you have me in this situation? Where is the blessing? Where is the victory? You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. You see, while we walk this life, we have to live by faith. And faith means you can't see God. Faith means you're not going to be able to see around the corner. And God and, and brings things into our lives to teach us and train us. And there are going to be times where God puts you in situations that it doesn't look like He's anywhere around. For the very purpose of teaching you and training you to stay focused on what you're supposed to do, even though He's not right there making you do it. One of the things that we taught Saber to do, and I'm teaching Brinks to do it, is if I tell you to stay and walk around the corner, he's going to stay. So if, if I have a dog and I, I'm walking out in downtown Madison and I want to run in and get a coffee, and people in there don't necessarily like my dog, I can tell him to stay, go in there and get my coffee, come out, and he'll still be staying there. As opposed to running across the street or chasing the lady with the ice cream cone. She's done, but he's learning. Do you, you obey? You see, God, have you ever been put in those situations as a Christian? Well, you knew that God was there. But you just don't feel that He's there. You ever been there? <laughs> Remember my first years in ministry, there were times where I would physically cry out to God, Where are you? I won't do this alone. I'll obey you, but I won't do it alone. God, where are you? I need to see something. Silence. God was teaching me to just trust. To just trust and obey. That God will do what He's going to do in His time. It is not my job to question and, and give God all the conditions within which I will obey. It is my job to trust Him and obey Him. That's hard. That is very hard. and that, So you need to just expect that there will be times where it's dark and it hurts and you're scared and your heart is crying out, God, where are you? He, he hasn't gone far. He knows exactly what's going on. He is testing you. He is training you. You keep calling out, but you keep obeying. Amen? We go to Romans chapter 5, you go to James chapter 1, look those two scriptures up later on. For the sake of time, I'm going to push on. So sometimes being Christians requires God to put us in situations where we struggle to feel His presence. Listen, sometimes building Christians requires God to put us in situations where we struggle to feel His presence. And there is... No greater example than this, Matthew chapter 27. Put back to Matthew chapter 27. We see a verse that to the immature or uninitiated can be a very confusing and difficult verse to get your head wrapped around. Of course, in Matthew 27, we find Jesus hanging on a cross you look at verse 46, it says this. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. 
That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did Jesus forget that God is omnipresent? No. The darkness, the separation, the weight of your sin, the weight of my sin was so heavy upon him that it caused him, God, to cry out, God, where are you? Let that sink in for a second. You know, Jesus knew the difference between a feigned, imaginary walk with Christ and the real thing. You see, a lot of people are all about Christianity when it's when the lights are on and when we're running around the house playing. But when the lights go off and it's time to just obey, when we face the challenges of not just being what God has called us to be, but coming alongside others and loving people who don't love us back. That's when we find ourselves in a situation where it's time to cry out to Him. Flip back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, we read the first part of this, where the psalmist is calling God to forgive him of his sin. This is, you know, again, David. But look at, uh, let's start in verse number 12. Excuse me, verse 11. Where it says, Cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Get this. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You know, this is Jesus. And this is what God has called us to do. You know, family and church and patriotism are all well and good tonight when it's easy. When we can wave our flags and we can sing our songs and you can sit comfortably and listen to me blabber on. But when it's time to start paying the price, when your kids break your heart, when someone in the church breaks your heart, breaks my heart, chooses to walk away. That's when more than any more than any other time we need to cry out to him. It's what's necessary. We we still cry out. You know, both of these scenarios serve to remind us of something very, very important. We were never intended to remain in this life. This isn't how it's supposed to be. Adam and Eve walked with God physically. Imagine what it must have been like for Jesus out there in the desert. (coughs) Remembering heaven. Remembering angels coming back and forth, doing whatever he wanted, imagine what it must have been like for him to be out there hungry, cold, lonely, struggling with being flesh and still being God at the same time. He was intimately aware of the fact that he was, that things weren't right, that 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 wasn't what he was designed for, but that's what where he was put to do the job. Aren't you glad he did that? Aren't you glad that Jesus 
came. That's why. That's what Christmas is all about. That He chose to put on flesh so He could be cold, so He could be hungry, so He could be in the dark, so He could find Himself in prison and hurt. <coughs> and even God called out to His Father. Flip back to Romans chapter eight. I don't want to get too technical here, but this is this is the text. This is what we need to read. Romans chapter eight. Let's begin reading in verse number 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible says this. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Do you catch that? There is within every human being, there is, as the song saying, even, even the world, even this physical world, is aware of the fact that we are absent, that we are without the glory and the presence of God. I know this can get pretty deep, but, but hang in. My friends... You have within you an instinct that recognizes a lack. That we were designed to be in the presence of God, physically. We are here for a time. The Bible says right here that we are put here for a job. The same way that Jesus was put here to do a job, that's the point. We are to endure You know, whatever, it, it, it's true that through prayer, through study, through meditation, you and I can experience in, incredible, powerful, life-changing relationships with God. I want to make sure to, to put this parenthesis in here. When you tr learn how to pray, when you learn how to study God's Word practically and digest God's Word really and meditate, that means chew on the truth of God, you can be in the darkest of places and have joy. Life-changing power of God. Just meditating on the fact of His omnipresence. Amen. The fact of His presence. But understand something. That is nothing. That pales in comparison to the reality that we will experience when we are with Him. Amen? Amen. You know, and I'm telling you, some Christians, it, it, it bugs me. Because they seem to act as if this isn't the case. They seem to act as if their prayer life is enough. That their walk through the meadow is enough. That they, they walk and talk with Jesus and it's so sweet and everything's so wonderful. The more I get close to God, the more aware I am that this world is not my home. That I don't belong here. That there's something missing and I want Him. I want to be there. I want to see Him. This is not okay. This is not good enough. In... 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we hear the Apostle Paul talking about wishing really to be unclothed from flesh. Longing for his life to end so he could be with God, but knowing that he is to be faithful while he's here. That might be hard to comprehend when you're 12. It might be hard to comprehend when you're 20. 
It might be hard to comprehend when you're 80. We cling to life. Sometimes we cling to the wrong parts of life. We get so attached to this body, to our house, to our farm, to our job, to our uh, a car, a yard. We get so attached to stuff that we forget that it's all going to burn. There will be times when your spirit longs to be where you belong. It's good. It's good. It is good and it is healthy for you and I to long for the presence of God in that capacity. Don't get too comfortable in this world. Don't get too comfortable with that television. Don't get too comfortable with that radio, that internet, those friends. Don't get too comfortable in that house. We're pilgrims, we're sojourners. And a healthy Christian, a wise Christian, a mature Christian, will have within us a longing to go home. One of the hardest things for us to deal with is death. You do not know how many, I'm telling you, the sweetness, the power, and the inspiration of seeing an old saint say, stop praying that I live. I'm ready to go. I'm no good to anybody here. I can hardly talk. I'm just chewing up money. I'm ready to go. And I always tell them, well, you suck it up because you're still here. And there's a nurse that needs you, a witness. And there's your family that needs you to be strong. You suck it up, and I will. That's exactly what I'll tell you. When God's ready to take you, He'll take you. You be faithful, and you sprint to the finish line. If you really think you're that close, go harder. Man, I've heard, mm. I've had people say, I'm trying. I'm trying. I've seen people die in heart. Hardly conscious, coming in and out of conscious, grabbing people's hands and saying, you know the Lord. I had a dear old saint trying to lead me to Christ. He forgot who I was. <laughs> They're trying to encourage him. His mind went and he asked me if I knew the Lord. Amen. That sprinting toward the finish line for all he was worth. Long for home. You know, Spend that time longing for home. But, I, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah came into presence with God. How did he end that time? Here am I, send me. We're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. When you come to the end of that longing and you need to come to, when that period of time, when you say, alright, I've been longing for Christ... You need to remember, we're supposed to carry some gifts with us, right? We're supposed to serve Him up to the, we're supposed to spread to the finish line. When I spend time with God and I find myself longing to be in His presence, I remember, oh my goodness, I'm going to be in His presence. I got work to do. I don't want to go today. I don't want to go tomorrow. There's people that need saved. This is not the best. This is not my best for Christ. There's going to be more. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get stronger. It's going to get healthier. There's going to be more people getting saved. You are going to be stronger. We're going to put out generation after generation of rock-solid young people. If the Lord tarries. Amen? That's how I want to enter into eternity. It's this conflict. Lord, I want to be with you. But when I see you, I've got to hear that. I've got to hear that, that well done. You know what I mean? I don't know about you. I got more I can do. I got more I want to do. I got plans. I got sermons to preach. I got people that aren't saved yet. Seems like yesterday that uh, Brinks was a little puppy howling in his crate at night, chewing on my shoes. Today, he is a healthy, strong, happy. Useful companion, relatively well trained. 
You know, he's learned to fear my presence when he's done wrong. I tell you. When we went home Thanksgiving, I saw that dog dart out of the door when Annie walked in. He didn't run toward the car. He ran toward the woods. Because he knew he was busted. He even had a turkey leg. Sometimes you come in the door... And he's right there in your face, yelping and jumping. Sometimes you walk in the door, he's nowhere to be found. He's under a bed. The worst, you know. part, the worst part is we can't really tell who did it because uh, Brunch will be in your face and Max will be underneath the table. Yeah, you have to discern which one did it. <laughs> you know something that's interesting, though? Even when he's done wrong, Brinks longs for me. He wants me. He'd sleep in the bed if we let him. He'd sit on our laps if we let him. Smack Danny today, hurt her. He'd follow me anywhere and everywhere if I let him. That dog finds his greatest fulfillment with me doing what I want him to do. That image when I heard that puppy screaming in the night, I could envision Brinks looking up at me desperate. Tell me what to do. Tell me where we're going to go. Tell me what we're going to do. I just want to be with you. Maybe we can learn something about being and building Christians. I'm a howling puppy. Questions, thoughts, comments? We'll get into our prayer time.